Hello dear students, today we will discuss about the vascular disease of the central nervous system, especially the cerebral edema, the hydrocephalus and the herniations. Cerebral edema is the accumulation of excess fluid within the brain parenchyma. Excess fluid within the brain parenchyma. There are two mechanisms by which this could occur. One is the vascogenic, vasogenic edema. This means the integrity of the normal blood-brain barrier is disrupted. It is usually seen in inflammation and in tumors. Cytotoxic edema, cytotoxic edema is related to an increase in intracellular fluid which is secondary to either a neuronal or a glial or endothelial cell membrane injury. This is seen in hypoxia or ischemic injury. So there are two types of edema, vascogenic edema, here the blood brain barrier is disrupted, it is seen in inflammation and tumors. Cytotoxic edema, here it is secondary to neuronal, glial or endothelial cell membrane injury. It is seen in hypoxia or ischemic injury. Usually the cerebral hemisphere shows the sulci which are quite deep and then you can see in between two sulci we have the gyrus which is raised. In the case of cerebral edema, you can notice that this area, the sulci are flat, the gyri are flattened and the sulci, the intervening sulci are narrow. Okay, blood vessels are lying in between the gyri in, in within the sulci. But here the gyri are flattened. Okay, so the gyri are not um, not like as you would see in a normal picture. This shows that there is cerebral edema. Coming to hydrocephalus, there is an increase in the CSF, cerebrospinal fluid volume, within all or part of the ventricular system. So either the entire ventricular system is involved or just a small part of it. It happens due to impaired flow or impaired resorption of the, of the cerebrospinal fluid. So either there is a problem with the flow or there is a problem with the resorption of the cerebrospinal fluid. The cerebrospinal fluid is resorbed by the or absorbed by the arachnoid granulation. Okay, so if there is any block over there, it can cause uh, hydrocephalus. In rare instances, there could be a tumor of the choroid plexus. Choroid plexus is the place where uh, which produces the uh, cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, so if any tumor of the choroid plexus are there, it can cause hydrocephalus. There could be an overproduction of the cerebrospinal fluid. All these are the reasons for hydrocephalus. Now we need to correlate with the hydrocephalus development and infancy. So when the hydrocephalus develops in infancy, that is a, a, a baby which is born like one year old, within one year, before the closure of the cranial suture, okay, the cranial sutures, um, it's called as anterior fontanel, posterior fontanel and uh, lateral fontanels. So the anterior fontanel closes at the age of one and a half years, that is 18 months. So if the hydrocephalus develops before the closure of the uh, cranial suture, okay, 18 months in case of uh, anterior fontanels, whereas uh, the posterior fontanels is by about two months. Then there is an enlargement of the head, entire head. Now, the hydrocephalus which develops after the fusion of the sutures is associated with the expansion of the ventricles, the, the ventricles have to expand and there will be an increase in intracranial pressure 
but there will be no change in the head circumference no change in the head circumference okay so it all depends on the closure of the sutures or the uh, fusion of the sutures cranial sutures if it if the hydrocephalus is before that before the closure then there's in a complete enlargement of the head but if hydrocephalus develops after the fusion of the sutures then there will be increase in the ventricles there will be increase in the intracranial pressure but there will be no change in the head circumference because it's there's no space to expand the head the the bone has already uh, or the sutures have already closed now coming to herniations when the volume of the brain tissue increases beyond the limit permitted by the compression of the veins and displacement of the cerebrospinal fluid the intracranial pressure will increase okay so when the volume of brain tissue is going to increase with uh, beyond the limit permitted by the compression of veins so the veins are going to get compressed there's going to be a displacement of the cerebrospinal fluid and the intracranial pressure is also going to increase because the cranial vault is subdivided by rigid dural folds okay as you know that we have meninges which are covering the brain uh, from outer to inner it is the dura matter then arachnoid matter then pia matter so the dural folds are also called as the fox and the tentorium okay which is very uh, closely related to uh, this condition about herniation uh, because the cranial vault is subdivided by rigid dural folds like the fox cerebri fox cerebelli and the tentorium cerebelli a focal expansion of the brain causes it to be displaced in relation to these partitions okay so these uh, these rigid folds will be there and then the brain has to be displaced in relation to these partitions if the expansion is sufficiently severe if it's very very large then there has to be herniation the herniation will occur the usual consequence of such displacement is compromise of the blood supply to the pushed tissue so when the tissue is pushed then there's also may be a compromise of the blood supply to the pushed tissue and this may cause infarction this often leads to another round of swelling and further herniation okay so then there will be herniation then there is going to be uh, infarction and again there's going to be another swelling and then there's again going to be herniation so it's like a cycle here we can see the folds this is called as fox fox cerebri which separates the two cerebral hemispheres okay and then we have this small uh, fox okay fox cerebelli which separates the two seri uh, cerebellar hemispheres and this is called as tentorium cerebelli it separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum it forms a tent over the cerebellum that's why it's called tentorium cerebelli okay so please understand that these dural folds are very rigid now whichever brain surface is going to be close to this uh, is going to be affected let us see in the next diagram this is the medial surface of the brain of the cerebral hemisphere okay the artery which you are seeing here this is the anterior cerebral artery which is running in the callosal sulcus this is called as corpus callosum and the sulcus just above is called as the callosal sulcus so the anterior cerebral artery this is the uh, cingulate gyrus which is present here this is the cingulate gyrus which is between the uh, callosal sulcus and the cingulate sulcus is is called as the cingulate gyrus and this is the medial surface which is related to the fox cerebri as we saw in the previous diagram 
the location of the fox cerebri between the two cerebral hemispheres. Now we can see the posterior cerebral artery which is running in the calcarine sulcus. Okay, in the calcarine sulcus. This part of the um, inferior surface of the cerebral hemisphere is called as uncus. It's related to the temporal lobe. And this surface is called as the inferior surface or tentorial surface which is related to the tentorium cerebelli. Please keep all these uh, structures in mind. Coming to the herniation. So there are three types of herniation. One is subfalcin hernia herniation. Then there is transtentorial herniation. And then there is tonsillar herniation. This section is a coronal section of the brain. Coronal section. It's very important whenever you see a cut section of the brain to identify which section we are looking into. This is a coronal section. So this in the in the center, the dural fold here, this should be the fox cerebri. Okay, so this is sub falcin uh, herniation. That means it is just below the fox. It is just below the fox cerebri. Okay, so this is a herniation over here. Now, which part of the um, medial surface of the cerebrum it was if you remember from the previous diagram it will be related to the um, cingulate gyrus cingulate gyrus okay and which artery was present here it was the anterior cerebral artery this is what you need to correlate the other previous diagram with this okay now looking at this surface here okay before that we have to see what is this this dural fold is the tentorium cerebelli So the tentorium cerebelli, which is another dural fold, and here you can see that uh, this is the transtentorial herniation. So uh, which part of the uh, brain is it? It is the uncus, okay, the temporal uh, lobe, part of the temporal lobe. And which artery may be involved here? This is the posterior cerebral artery, okay, posterior cerebral artery. Okay, and uh, then coming to, uh, this is actually the cerebellum which you are seeing here, right, this is the cerebellum, cerebellar hemispheres, okay, so this part uh, which is protruding down, that's the tonsillar herniation, uh, this tonsil is a part of the uh, cerebellum, okay, now this not only, uh, there's a problem with the infarction related to the tonsillar herniation. Also, it is going to impinge this part of the brain stem. This part of the brain stem. Okay. So, we will see it in the coming up slides what happens. So, subfalcin herniation is unilateral expansion of the brain. Uh, again, we can see that this is a coronal section over here. This is a coronal section of the brain. So these are the uh, lateral ventricles which you are seeing here, these spaces, these are the lateral ventricle. Okay, so here we can see clearly that there is uh, a unilateral, it's, it's only on one side, so it's unilateral expansion of the brain. It has displaced the cingulate gyrus which is present here and it will compress the anterior cerebral artery. Here it is the uh, transtentorial herniation which is the medial aspect of the temporal lobe and it is also called as uncinate herniation because the uncus is, uh, is being herniating. Then there will be compression of the third cranial nerve uh, because it, it will compress on the, uh, the upper part of the brain stem that is the midbrain. The third cranial nerve is uh, related to the midbrain and will cause pupillary dilatation. Third nerve also supplies the uh, constrictor pupillae.
okay it is parasympathetic to constrictor pupillae so here it will cause pupillary dilatation impairment of the ocular movements because uh, it is also giving um, nerve supply to the extraocular muscles except superior oblique and the lateral rectus on the side of the lesion and it's called as blown pupil okay so the pupil is going to be enlarged pupil dilatation of the same side of the lesion posterior cerebral artery uh, can also be affected and this may cause uh, occipital lobe infarction okay occipital lobe infarction now there could be a compression of the contralateral that is the opposite side cerebral peduncle cerebral peduncle now this is going to um, carry the uh, pyramidal fibers or the uh, corticospinal tract fibers and it will cause ipsilateral the same sided hemiparesis weakness of the half of the body and we can also see duret hemorrhage so the can you see all this hemorrhage spots here these are this is called as duret hemorrhage in the pons and the midbrain so that it's quite extensive amount of uh, uh, damage that the transtentorial herniation can do coming to tonsillar herniation the cerebellar tonsils will pass through the foramen magnum as you can see here this is the this is the uh, part of the tonsils which are uh, being uh, uh, herniation through the foramen magnum this is the normal tonsil which we are seeing here in in the cerebellum inferior surface of the cerebellum this can compress the respiratory centers of the medulla so it is it is going to compress the respiratory center this is the medulla here so it is going to compress the respiratory centers on the medulla and uh, this can cause uh, you know, even cause death in some patients okay by this we have finished uh, today's session